Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the fourth in the Wheeler Centre's Africa Talk series. And tonight we are going to be talking books and tales and narratives. But before we, we begin, I would like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. All right, so books, writing, literature. To help me flesh out these topics, um, I've got a panel with me. And right next to me is Abdi Aden. And Abdi was a teenager when he arrived in Melbourne as a refugee to begin a new life. Until recently, he was a youth worker for Hume City Council in Melbourne, completing postgrad studies in adolescent mental health. He's married to the daughter of British immigrants and has three young sons. His biography, Shining, which I've got here, the story of a lucky man, written with Robert Hillman, was released in June this year. And just a quick note that you can actually um, buy the books at the end of this talk, right at the end, um, and the authors will stay back to sign them. And seated next to Abdi is Alia, Alia Gabrez, and she's a Melbourne-based poet and storyteller. She's a community arts and cultural development practitioner with a focus on facilitation and teaching, using storytelling as a tool for knowledge generation and cultural transmission. 2015 saw Alia attend the Africa Rights Festival in the UK and complete a residency at the School for Social Sciences in Eritrea. She's currently a creative producer at Footscray Community Arts Centre and undertaking a Master of Community and Cultural Development through the Victorian College of the Arts. And seated next to Alia is Valanga, Valanga Koza. And he left South Africa in 1976, exiled along with many other young people because of their struggle against apartheid or racism. The music and stories he has since created reflects the places he has been and the people he has touched throughout his journey across the world as a refugee, finally settling in Australia. Valanga has performed and warmed audiences of adults and children at selected world music events and in many schools across Australia and the Pacific, as well as recording six albums of original music. He's also the author of well-known Ghazani and the Tricky Baboon, republished by Ford Street Publishing in 2014. Please make our guests feel very welcome. I just realised I didn't introduce myself. Um, my name is Centilla Chingaipe and I am a journalist with SBS World News. So I thought the first question I wanted to ask each of you, and I will probably begin with you, Abdi, because you're closest to me, is what's your favourite African book? Well, mine first. Yeah. Um, Do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I ha I, it's hard to say, but the, there was one came out. Um, I think it was last year. It's called Bulawayo. I don't know if you if, if um, is it Zimbabwean. Um, oh, the one by No yeah. Violet Bulawayo. Yeah, it's and I, I got a copy yesterday. I meant to get it a long time ago, but uh, that's my favourite book right now. Yep. Yeah. Alia, do you have a favourite? I'm going to be a bit tricky. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I have to. Um, I'm going to say um, poetry, spoken word poetry by um, a traditional spoken, well, orator, I'd say, um, in Eritrea, Yuma Mariam. Um, her work is amazing and uh, we're currently working on a collection of um, all of her uh, poet poems, so I'd say that. Hmm. So what does her work touch on, if you don't mind sharing? So she actually was part of the liberation movement um, in Eritrea and um, her poetry really um, spoke to a lot of the struggles that the Eritrean um, people, and specifically the Eritrean women, um, were um, having to live with under occupation and through the liberation movement. So I guess it's liberation poetry, um, and it's incredibly moving, and it's really, she's a poet that not many people know of, and so I'm very excited about seeing that work come out. Yep, great, and what about you, Valanga? Um, I'm learning something. I have to look up, uh, you know, the, um, the poetry that you're speaking about. I really enjoyed uh, Bulawayo as well. It's a beautiful book that you mentioned, Abdi. My um, uh, favorite book of all time, and I think uh, uh, it will continue to be, uh, because it's still relevant today, it's a book by an African author, uh, Chinua Achebe, and it's called Things Fall Apart. Uh, the center can no longer hold. I find that book still relevant today. You know, when I, when I travel to South Africa, I am seeing elements of that book. It's a very powerful book. Do you mind elaborating? 
on, on that point? Um, you know, it's interesting. We, um, we fight for freedom. And then we get the freedom. Um, you know, the freedom that we fought for wasn't based on uh, wanting to build a mansion for oneself and one's family and forget about everyone else. That freedom was not based on, uh, on uh, achieving freedom and then getting a government tender and then scheming 90% uh, of what the government is paying or what the government is uh, paying for that road that you meant to build and only use 10% of the funds to build a road which doesn't last even six months. And I've just come back from South Africa and there's lots of evidence of things like that. Mm. So one of the reasons why one I was curious as to know what your favorite African books were, but I'm also fascinated by this idea of African writing. Is there such a thing as an African book or an African writer? Uh, I'll go first. Um, I find I'm a more storyteller than uh, author. I mean, I, I find coming from Somalia and Horn of Africa, I, I don't know whether writing a book is very popular, you know, in, in, in Af I don't want to generalize in Africa because South Africa is different to Somalia and uh, in different ways, but I find the storytelling is something I grow up with, you know, in Somalia. But I, always, I also wanted to do always something realistic. What's the, what African storyteller and author mean? Sometimes you might write a book, but you actually expected the Western way of writing. So I try to be realistic. What's the African storytelling? Is that more powerful than writing? So for me, I, I, I like to see myself storytelling one way or the other. Then writing is something that I can, I can reach so many people, doesn't matter what, the, what background they come from. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone else want to add to that? I guess I, I don't understand the need for that label. Um, I don't see apart from obviously centralising African experiences and African characters, which should really just be the same as any other genre of writing, I don't really understand what the need for that label might be. Um, I think that obviously if it were to address needs around visibility and representation in terms of diversity, then yeah, I understand that. But I guess it's that question of, you know, that, that section in the bookstore that's black writing. I can never really understand what black writing was. Was it characters, stories? I'm not exactly sure. So, I mean, if it's to address a need in terms of um, greater visibility and representation, sure. But again, I wonder how, you know, authors would feel about their works being um, delegated to that one specific shell. Mm. Longer? Um it's uh, being a musician as well. It's similar to um, um, recording music and then going to a shop and your music is only available in a section which says world music. What about the rest of the music? Does it, does it belong to the world? Mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, so it's, a, it, it's the same way of labeling uh, uh, the, you know, African uh, writing. In South Africa, there's... Um, I guess being South African, there's various um, uh, writers of South African origin, and some of whom, like you know, uh, Seki Ampatele, uh, who lived in exile for um, for a long time, uh, Dennis Brutus, who also died in you know in a, you know in exile in uh, Chicago, who were known as uh, writers as well as um, an amazing uh, poet. But like uh, Abdi said, I come from a, a tradition where. Um, what I'll always remember and what I share with, um, uh, with kids and I also, I also like to share with adults as well. Uh, that setting that I grew up in where um, every day in the evening there was a fire in the village, you know, in my grandparents' homestead. After, you know, dinner, you, we all sat around the fire and there were stories. Stories because it's an oral tradition and stories passing information about uh, how to respect your elders, how to deal with problems when you're out there, or even just basically animals interacting with human beings, speaking to each other. Mm. So that said, I mean, there, there are great texts like Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart that I hailed as you know, some of the greatest you know, African literature texts. 
Um, do you think there's some kind of pressure when it comes to authors that are trying to express themselves as Africans in the midst of this cloud of, you know, texts like, you know, Things Fall Apart and others that have since followed? Yeah, for me to answer that question is um, I go to a lot of um, um, uh, literature festivals and uh, I feel that pressure that you just mentioned, you know, like a, a pressure to, uh, to fit in, you know, with the other authors and write, you know, um, uh, a book that fits in that mold of the Western style of uh, writing. I'm in the middle of a, uh, Abdi, how long did it take you? I mean, uh, you should be asking questions, but how long did it take you to write that book, Shining? Two and a half years. Well, I've been writing my biography for five years and I still haven't finished. And I'm having um, a hard time you know, dealing with that. But also, whenever I go to these conferences, whenever I go to these uh, presentations, which are very successful, you always feel like you can see someone showing up with a, like a mound of books. And you go, wow, when, I, when am I going to write this book <laughs> that just keeps on going and going because of you know, that whole experience of having come from South Africa, going via other African countries uh, through America and then, you know, eventually Australia as a, as a refugee and also an undocumented refugee, you know, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Alia, do you have any thoughts about that pressure to fit into a particular mould as an, a yeah. writer of African origin? Mm. I guess the most, um, the book that comes to mind is Americana. Um, and, um, I mean, Chimamanda does such a great job of um, tackling really contemporary issues of migration and, um, you know, where do you go to get your hair braided, you know, mm. in the States and dating um, interracial, well, I'm not exactly sure if it's interracial dating, but, you know, dating outside of your specific culture. And these are contemporary <coughs> themes that don't fit into the box of what is expected of um, a traditional African um, book or um, a novel. So I think that, again, I'm going to go back to that, to that um, point, not having to deal with the label or having, not having to deal with the box um, frees people to, you know, to address some of the, the more relevant and contemporary themes um, that we experience as Africans within a contemporary context, um, especially in the diaspora. So Chimamanda talks a lot about um, diaspora and I think it's, it's very relevant for uh, communities at the moment. Mm. And a lot of the, the writers, the contemporary writers um, that we're re hearing about these days, like Chimamanda, Novalet, Bulawayo, the issues that they address, do you think that they're a fair representation of the reality of many Africans? I mean, or is it just a representation of the diaspora? I, I think, just to answer the, the other question too, I find that uh, I'm realistic. I mean, I'm the minority of minority in Australia. I'm not... So I can understand why there's a pressure for us to express, you know, when you go in a writer's festival. But, but again, you know, I, I really honestly would like to be recognised my talent and my good looks works. <laughs> um, and uh, just to say Abdi's an author and he's like that, I, I prefer that rather than you just being African. And sometimes when media writes something or, or, or they will say, or um, these three guys, they're writers and they're Africans, but they're also refugee or they're women and they wear, hey, you don't have to mention all that. You know, and if you're gonna mention that, you might as well mention the good looks, you know, I find that funny. But, uh, but the idea is that, yeah, we struggle with that. But also, to make myself balance, I have to be realistic to say, actually, um, I am the minority, so I can that. But it, it, the frustration is there and that. But the other question was, is that when African writers write, it would be nice to write for us to what is like fiction and what's, you know, like everyone else, rather than writing a, like a specific thing. I don't have to, I'd rather write a fiction where Man and a woman met under the tree and they got married and they love each other, you know, like, like everyone else. But I have to write something that relevant what I look like. So does that make sense? So it, it's quite hard sometimes to write what you want and what you talent. Like, I mean, I can imagine these guys got so much talent, what they do, but I'd rather read your talent than your African. Does that make sense? 
So, so yeah. you know, that's what I like to see. You, how talented you are! You play music and poetry, and I enjoy it like everyone else. So, it's a pressure there. But I, I try to help myself as a person, mm. not to get my head up. You know, like oh, you know, I'm always this and I'm all that. But it, it is there. Okay. And that labeling that you're speaking about, I mean, <laughs> there are times when it works in one's favor. You know, uh, you wouldn't get into a festival unless you were, you know, uh, classified um, as an African uh, uh, drama. storyteller or, or, or drama or, you know, African musician. Uh, but also, like you, you know, like there's that yearning to just be part of uh, uh, the program as a person. Who's come to make, you know, who's come to do a presentation, just like everyone else, you know, basically. But I guess, you know, um, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a double, you know, edged sword of some sort where you you gain something, but you also lose something, yes, which yeah. locks you into this little box, which you want to come out of, you know, as well. And it'll be good to come out of that box. Mm. So, what about? the African writers on the continent that are writing stories about where they're from and their homelands and why we don't hear much about them. Because a lot of the you know, writers of African heritage that we do hear about that win the big international prizes are based overseas um, and have access to you know, opportunities that you know, other African writers might not. Why mm -hmm. do you think that is? I think that's got to, still got to do with uh, colonialism, you know, basically, you know, the, you know, the background of Africa. Uh, as being dependent on the, the former colonial power, you know, powers basically. Um, there's um, many authors that come from South Africa. There's many authors, I assume, that come from Ethiopia, Eritrea, and uh, Somalia, and uh, you know, all over Africa. Brilliant uh, 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 authors that are not represented, you know, internationally, and yet you have to go to the, you know, to uh, to Africa to find out about them, and it would be good. If they, if they were as well represented as um, you know the, the the African writers in the diaspora, mm. and and why is that important? Why is that narrative written by Africans vital? I mean, earlier you touched on Chimamanda's Americana, and when she talks, when she's in the hair salon, the braiding, and you know that resonates to a lot of African women who have gone through that experience, and obviously reading about it makes you feel like you. You know, you're heard, Visible. you're seen, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, what do you What do you think about that? Like, you know, um, I guess uh, there's a challenge and an opportunity. Um, the way that I see it, in terms of um, African writers on, in the continent um, at the moment, translation is really key, and mm. I think that that's possibly not a, an issue that's been. Um, I guess it's a question that hasn't been answered: how to do it well. Um, and how to do it often. Oftentimes when we're hearing about these writers, um, it's because they're translated into English oh. or French or whichever other um, language. But writers are not, there isn't a real drive to translate between um, countries or between dialects. And, and I think that that's an opportunity that's, that's lost. And I guess um, it goes back to, if we're writing for ourselves, for ourselves primarily, um, African writers, a huge continent, we would be translating in each other's languages, but we're not. Um, we're not often. There's an aspirational need to translate into these other languages, and I think that in terms of visibility, it would be amazing to be able to um, read you know, the vast range of different um, authors and, and stories. And I think in terms of representation and diversity, it would, it would bring a whole nother world to the forefront um, that currently I think is a little bit untapped and a little bit um, underdeveloped. Mm. Abdi? I think it's like everything else, you know, where African people are not recognised what they do. It's like everything else in the books. I, I find when, when in, in a story, a book writing, um, all, uh, the, um, the publishers will say, oh, can we sell this? So at the end of the day, it comes down to how many things they can sell and copies. So if, if it's not that popular, then, then you won't sell, uh, like everyone else, where, you know, like it would have been nice to write a good story and then recognise and then publish it and see how many people, I think, I'm sure all these people in this room will read it. And if, if African writer writes something good story like everyone else, 
who are well known, and there's a culture there that African people does, don't don't fit in. Um, like there's a culture about books in the Western world. Once you wanted to write a book, African writer, and to sell Western world, you have to fit in that. So that's a big barrier. And and like everyone else said here, uh, in in the fact that that's how I see it. And and the other thing I always tell young people because I do public speaking, two three thousand people a week. So. Uh, I, I'm very comfortable what I look like, as I said before. So what happens is uh, I always say to young people, and it's very exciting, and they will say, oh, my God, I never thought that, that my name, when I, when I become an author and I wrote, actually never changed my name. So my name is Abdi Aiden, an author. So that's for me, it's very empowering because to see a name, uh, I don't have to change my name to Mo or something like that. Mm. So... But then again, you wrote an autobiography, so... No, no, but, but even... But do, what do you mean? Like, no, no, but even... For example, what I mean is that, you know, to show people how bright I am, my achievement. Yeah. So to remind people... It, it's a psychology... Well, I, I just think reverse psychology, I think, anyway. But <laughs> uh, just to tell people I can be talented to write a book or I can be anything like that. So just to not to... Ch that's what I meant. I don't mean changing names, but to, to see a lot of people with different cultures. It's actually empowering. Not only s African people, but other cultures too, to see. Yeah. Mm. Belanga? You know, what you, uh, what you touched on in terms of like, why is it important to get stories like a viewpoints, you know, from Africa, from African writers who are based in Africa, um, there's current issues within, those, uh, within the continent, you know, current issues that touch the continent, which uh, to share with the world, uh, translate, you know, if, if uh, there's enough you know, translation happening, uh, the world will learn a lot and even be more educated about uh, uh, the continent, about Africa and the, you know, and the different cultures there. It's, um, I mean, like when you look at the Latin American writers, who many of whom, to me, it seems like they are more translated into English than African writers. Uh, the same thing should be happening the other way around. But I guess, uh, you know, it, um, it's up to us as Africans to, uh, to take up that project, to take up that course and start to say, okay, we're going to tackle this problem. I don't have to just concentrate on um, uh, telling stories of my, you know, about myself, telling stories that they only have to do with me or, or write a book, you know, only um, that has to do with who you are as an author. Mm -hmm. But maybe, you know, delving into translations, delving into introducing those books to other people to translate them as well. Mm. But yeah. do you think, you know, do you think Africans have perhaps um, found their voices in, in being able to express themselves in writing? Because as Abdi mentions, there are many pressures for people that are writing, not just in the diaspora, but on the continent as well, whether it's trying to get a publishing deal, whether it's trying and fitting that mould that's already been created and that if your story does not have pain and conflict and struggling in it, it perhaps might not sell. And if you are trying to make a living as a writer, you know, are you forced to then compromise on what sort of narrative you then put out? Yeah, basically, uh, it's what sells, isn't it? Like, as you say, there's going to be conflict of some sort, and that it seems like uh, with um, publishers, that's what they want. Um, you know, uh, uh, my book that I'm working on, you know, it seems like I'm going to be working on that book forever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the publisher wants me to hurry in, in, you know, in writing the book, and yet I want to do more research, I want to go and find out uh, uh, more things. Last week I was lucky to be in South Africa. Um, I um, decided, because my last uh, place of accommodation was when I was in South Africa was a, a prison called uh, John Foster Square which has changed, since changed name, They've ca they call it uh, Johannesburg Central Police Station. And I, to visit that place, which to me, I have never really got myself psychologically to deal with visiting that, uh, 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 that compound, to go to that compound and, and show up and suddenly realize that, wow, the police are very friendly to me. They took me inside and showed me around, and then they wanted me to point out the, which gate I, I, I used to flee from, the, you know, from, uh, from that prison, and I showed it to them, and they were all joyful. They were calling each other. It was almost like a celebration, and I felt like you know, that fear was purged from me, and that's, 
that's the hard time that I'm having with writing the book, revisiting, you know, that past. Mm. But that's what the um, uh, uh, the publishers want. They want all that mud, but they want it in a rush, and yet I have to deal deal with it my own in my own time. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say also that it's not all bad. I mean, uh, I've never thought as a young boy, I've never thought I'll see uh, African authors and artists as many as now we are. So actually, it's a good thing, you know, I mean, to, to see a lot of people sitting here and, and everyone else uh, uh, listening, I think it's great, you know, and thank you all. And it's not a, all bad. I mean, I, I, as I said, I never dream seeing my lifetime that what I'm, what I'm seeing <clears throat> myself. And these guys. So it's actually I'm I'm really celebrating and very lucky to be um, seeing what I'm seeing. Hmm. Alia, did you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, I guess in terms of the question, a lot of times um, we see ourselves through either the lens of a tragic news story or through the lens of development. Um, you know. So that's a, the reality of, of um, uh, the narratives that um, are used to uh, describe the Af African experience. Um, there are pressures. There are always pressures. There are, you know, whether it's dealing with a publisher or wh whoever it is. Um, there are issues of tokenism, and you do feel that as mm. um, as an as an artist, as a writer, you feel that. Um, but again, I think that's where self-representation is crucial, and um, you have people that are doing amazing work, whether it's in, through digital media, whether it's through self-publishing. Um, there are obviously very micro um, uh, challenges to these systems and structures, but it's something. And in terms of um, having any kind of agency over your own story and, and, and what kind of a, a, a narrative you, you want to reflect and project, I think that there's really exciting work that's happening with a lot of um, collectives and a lot of young um, storytellers and writers um, in the digital sphere. So I think it, it's hard, but I think that there are avenues and we continue to, ha to have to struggle in, in terms of being able to have access to self-representation that is appropriate and um, representative, I suppose. Mm. So I want to, I mean, we're, we're mainly talking about books and novels and you write a lot of poetry. Um, and I know when Namwali Seppel, who won the Kane Prize for African writing this year, she wrote a short story and it was, I think, one of the fewest time in recent time that anyone's actually won the Kane Prize for a short story. Um, a lot of African storytelling traditionally has been in the form of short stories and poetry and music. What would you say to young people that are trying to find their voice in perhaps, you know, not necessarily thinking about the novel as an avenue, but perhaps short stories, poetry and music as a way of expressing themselves and sharing their narratives? Yeah. I guess for me, it took me a long time. I did an undergrad in um, professional writing and it took me a long time to, to decolonize my own understanding of story um, because the way that I understood it obviously growing up in the diaspora, is that it was a novel and it was uh, an, an article or, you know, this and that and the other, um, which is really what I aspired to at a certain point and felt really deflated because I, I wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't make sense to me in what I was doing. Um, so a lot of the work that I've had to do since then is really to go through a process where I can say, actually, um, that right there that my grandmother's doing as she's making coffee and hanging out with her friends and it to me at the time looks it looked like gossip and just random <laughs> chit chat that's a story you know um this over here where um people are talking about um this and that that might have happened at the time of uh you know so and so was born and this city was being bombed at that time and I remember that, that's a story, you know. Um, so all of these little, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, decolonizing um, moments really helped me to frame 
my understanding of what a story was um, within a wider context. There's obviously room for the novel and there's obviously room for, for the poetry and there's room for the oral history and there's room for all of that. Um, and, and I think in talking to young people um, through the programs that, that I, not necessarily just young people, it took me a long time to arrive to this point of thinking, um, I try and really touch on that and allow people to define what they want it to be for themselves. And I think that goes back to the agency. Um, I think that's a really crucial thing for um, a lot of writers that are writing from possibly marginalised um, uh, places. Mm. Belanga? Um, the point that Alia mentioned, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving an example of um, uh, uh, your, your grandmother speaking, uh, sitting there talking about something, whether she's cooking and having a chat with a friend, uh, you know, looking at it as a, um, a gossip, but suddenly realizing that that's a story. And stories have to come from those kinds of simple things, basically, to encourage young people. I mean, I look at the, I, I listen to Alia speaking about uh, encouraging young people, and yet, you know, or of course, you know, um, Alia is way younger than me. And uh, uh, what I say, you know, uh, to my children is tell your stories. You don't have to tell my stories because my experience is completely uh, different from you. You know how we're talking, you know, Abdi, about, you know, do we have to uh, talk about stories of sadness and uh, mm -hmm. suffering and all that? Uh, uh, in a way, uh, not that there's no suffering in Australia. Yes, there's suffering. You know, you know uh, we all, uh, what we feel is what we know. You know, what we feel, the sadness that we feel at that time is what we know. But it won't be the same as um, having been a, a, a refugee, staying in a refugee camp. That's not my chil children's story. That's not the young people's story. And yet, where, wherever we are, there are stories. There, there is material for stories. Stories that can develop into a short story, a poem, or a novella, or a novel, you know, for that matter, as long as uh, they are worked on. So you've written a children's book story and it's an Australian children's book story yeah. with a young African child um, at the centre of it. First of all, why, what, what was the inspiration behind that? Why did you choose to write that, that book? Um, well, there's a lot of things I enjoy. I was about to say there's nothing that I enjoy as much as telling stories. Uh, telling stories, I really enjoy that. I've just come back from... Uh, um, uh, when I left this morning, I live in Frankston, I left very early this morning and drove to Wangaratta. Uh, had three different groups you know, of, of kids, 250 in each uh, session, telling them stories. And I, I really enjoy telling stories you know, um, uh, for the most part. And the inspiration for that story is, um, is my grandfather. My grandfather was this, uh, a storyteller who said to me, and I still remember this, and I think I was a a silly little kid when I look back, who said to me, if you want to tell stories like me, you have to make sure that um, uh, you, you add spices. And I said, okay, I'll tell a story. So I went to the kitchen and picked up some salt and pepper. And I came back and he said, what are you going to do with that? I said, it's for the story. He said, no, 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 no. What I mean is you have to dress up the story. So I went back to the, you know, I went to the bedroom and picked up uh, a t-shirt and some pants. And he said, what are you doing with that? I said, I'm going to dress up the story. But that forced me to really uh, try, and I'm still trying. You know, I could say I'm a, uh, I think I'll find it hard to say I'm a good storyteller. I'm still working on, a, on being a good storyteller. And you don't become a storyteller, according to my grandfather, until you have millions of wrinkles on your face. <laughs> and they are beginning to form on my face. <laughs> and so there's some gray hairs that are starting to show. The front here is beginning to look like a football field as well because <laughs> the hair is clearing. But I'm getting there. So wh why, why do you think your book, you know, it's a children's book, it's a picture book, yeah. beautifully illustrated. Um, how important is that such a book, particularly with the younger generation of African Australians that are growing up, having that kind of representation in a story that they can physically hold and you know be read to that's very different to some of the stories that I grew up with, for example, that didn't have African children 
as as the characters. As the characters, it's good to have those characters and let you know let kids, and in this case Aussie kids as well. You know the general Aussie wheat bix eating kid. You know to to look at the uh, picture book and see that there's characters and characters come in all form. You know uh, some of them um, have got blonde hair. Some of them are like the characters in my, you know, in my book who don't have blonde hair. And uh, uh, he, he grows up in a village. He's got the, uh, uh, it's very warm in the village where he lives. So he's only, he's only wearing shorts and he carries things on his head. Just, you know, those characters are just as important as the ones that, um, uh, you know, uh, people like, um, uh, shall I say, Andy Griffith, you know, come up with. You know, for the most part, they just play as much a, a, a role as those characters. And the story that I'm working on right now, again, it's for children, but it, it involves a kid who is in a refugee camp, but he finds joy in being in a garbage dump, like going th foraging through a garbage dump and finding things that to him, they are gold, but to someone else or other kids will go, yuck. And that's the reaction that I get from kids in schools when I tell them that story. So it's, it's good to, uh, to let kids that, you know, know that there's different ways of looking at, uh, uh, at, uh, at things. There's uh, different experiences that kids uh, have. Your, parent, your parents might be buying you a brand new toothbrush. But the kid in the refugee camp has found a toothbrush in the garbage dump. He's gone to wash it dunked it in hot water, it comes out, the bristles are facing every which way, but it still does a beautiful job of cleaning his teeth mm. and keeping them healthy. Mm. Abdi, your book, Shining, is a memoir. What, what made you decide to share your story with um, an Australian audience? Um, a, a lot of things. Uh, the person I am now, living in Australia, coming from Somalia, um, there's a lot of reasons why I wrote. I, I had a deep, I don't realise this, but I had a very deep, uh, deep passion to tell stories. I had an uncle who, uh, uh, he used to tell me stories. I knew the stories was not true. He's one of the biggest <laughs> liars I've ever met. And I used to laugh because his, his lies and it was a story. I didn't realise it was a story. And he used to lie about how hero he was. Even when the war, Ethiopia and Somalia, he's the only one survived out of, you know. And he, you know, never, nothing happened to him because he get rid of everyone and he's the only. And, but I had that deep, deep, and as, as you said before, when I tell stories to young people, it's actually, I, I love doing it. But when I came to Australia, storytelling as African, you talk about disaster. So I, I said to myself, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to talk disaster and always something happened. So I kind of stopped for a long time. And then I realized. So going back to the memoir is coming from war-torn, everyone else recognized you as a Somali person. There's a Somali pirates, Somali war, everything you name it. Um, you know, and Australia thinks refugees about something you know, uh, demonizing. As African person, as, as, as coming from even my religion. So uh, what happens is I was thinking to myself, I am black, I'm African looking, my religion is Muslim, and I got accent. So I have a lot of names and, and I, so I don't know what to do. You know, how do you survive the world where you turn a friend, you go a party, you talk to someone, they said, oh, you African, you must be a singer. Actually, I'm not good at singing. <laughs> you turn around and they say, are you Muslim? Yeah, what's all happening in the world? And people talk about it, names with black skin colour, you know, the bushfire, Black Saturday. I'm, I'm just mentioning it, you know. And, 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 and you talk about American television and the law and order. When you watch movies cry, the black guy's running and the white guy's chasing. So it, it, the whole things I decided, what do I do? How do I survive day to day? So... I, I, I wanted to tell stories and then I got the opportunity to write my story. So being a Somali, I want to tell Somali people, you can tell your story, Somalia used to be a great country and now there is a war. So it's not like what people remember, Black Hawk Down and as I say pirates and people come up with, I don't, that's just happened not long ago. So the reason I write the book was uh, my own story that I didn't think is worth writing because I thought everyone else suffered. <coughs> You know, why should I, you know, and, but again, 
for Australian people for education, to learn about Somalia, Somali people to respect each other, stop being tribal. And I wanted to tell my children that where I came from, but in a nice way, like my uncle used to tell stories. But um, so I, that's why I decided. So, so, so many different levels I did decide it, but it wasn't easy to write your own story because you talk about things you don't want to talk about it. Being a male, with, well, I talk about myself, we have an ego where you don't talk about your weaknesses and that. It took me a long time to write that. But also, again, um, I think it's worth it to tell children that being in what I look like is, and that's why I always say, who says I'm not good looking anyway? I tell people how good looking I am, whether they like it or not. Mm. So the story, um, so for me was, that's the reason I wanted to write. So different, did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, a little so different. I, I wanted to find out about something, that, a style that I noticed in your book, which is you, you, ha you had this way of, you would describe what was going on around you at that time in Somalia as you were growing up, but then you would also explain it to Australian audiences. Was that a deliberate attempt on your part to try and make them make sense of what you were, you were trying to say? Correct, yes. Um, because I wrote certain way and then when, when we were editing in that, sometimes it doesn't come out well. Most of the readers are not from Somalia, to be honest. You know, These guys will read it and I want to make sense to these guys. What's the point writing if, you know, I mean, it's point is good for Somalia, but so I had to make it well, I didn't actually make it, uh, I got it away with my, when I was talking to Harbour Collins, I didn't realise they would let me do what I wanted to do, which actually they did. I was very surprised. I thought, oh, they're going to change it here and there. So I tried to make a sense for the world, people to understand how Somalia was and the world was around me. So mm. I did it deliberately. Mm. Uh, yeah. I will ask you, Alia, um, do you think that, you know, Australian, African Australian writers, I know you talked about not labelling, um, but unfortunately sometimes, you know, that's um, how things w will work out. Do you think that the um, generation of African Australian writers that are coming up and are writing um, perhaps need to explain some of their narratives, like they need to explain them to the wider um, audience just so they can understand some of their experiences? I think it depends on um, who your audience is, who you're primarily writing for, apart from who the publisher's audience might be, or apart from who your uh, possibly your performance audience might be. You know, I think it's a question that you have to kind of ask yourself in terms of what the end goal might be. Um, I I've written poems where um, there are big chunks um, written in Tigre, which is my mother's original tongue, um, purposely, um, knowing that there will be people in the audience that do not understand. Um, we've made videos um, with that um, thought in mind. Um, there will be people that don't understand, but then there will be other people that, do, that definitely do understand. And I guess going back to that visibility and representation question, um, people come to um, experience uh, writing or a story for different reasons. I think that there is a melody to um, words that possibly is even outside of the realm of our um, cognitive understanding of what the story might be. Um, and I don't feel that it alienates an audience at all. So again, going back to your question, it, it depends on who, who you're writing for, essentially. Um, I think that going... Can, can writers just write for the sake of writing without necessarily thinking about the audience? You know, Valanga was talking about how his grandfather was saying to him that, you know, just put spices and do all this stuff and whatever's coming out of you, um, that's what you put to paper. Um, do, should, should writers really be thinking about that stuff? I mean, can you tell a story truthfully if you're factoring all of that in? Maybe your second book, yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you become famous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I find it um, uh, interesting. It's like, um, you know, when I, when I was learning to speak English and speak to, you know, to, uh, to audiences, I used to try, I mean, you can hear my thick South African accent when I speak, but I used to try and iron out my accent so that I could be um, under, you know, understood by people. And then I, I, I listened to um, uh, Russian professors um, uh, speaking English, uh, German professors speaking English. They did not care what they sounded like. They just um, 
deliver their lectures with their thick accent, breaking English and all that. And that taught me a lot, which is that I should just speak the way I speak. And I think, you know, as writers and storytellers, that's what we should do as well. I think sometimes it can be a little bit... I, I mm. understand your question around, you know, writing for the sake of writing, art for the, you know, art for the sake of art. Um, my personal opinion... I keep banging this thing. <laughs> <laughs> my personal opinion is that it's a little bit naive to think that, you know, that's potentially how your work will play out. I think that even if you don't have an agenda, there's usually going to be an agenda that your work will fit into, whether you decide that agenda or somebody else decides that agenda. So, um, again, that's probably a very political statement to make, but I think that no work can exist outside of a social uh, political context. So, um, with that being said, uh, sure, write for yourself, <laughs> great, but know that there's probably other things that play that will eventually weigh in. Yeah. All right, well, at this stage, I'm going to open up to the floor to take some questions. If you just put your hand up, uh, one of the ushers will come to you. Any questions? Okay, while well, you think about what sort of questions you want to ask, I want to know, is there such a thing as an African-Australian piece of writing or book or poem? Um, the... What I do, um, public speaking with schools, and I do 20% non-schools, but I think, yes, even the humour. You have to have African-Australian humour. So what, what is that? Do you mind describing that? Uh, you put me on the spot. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like, if you tell a joke about uh, something not... Uh, if, you, if you're talking to an um, Aust Australian audience, even the Aust African people, like ourselves, we we love African Australian jokes, like the way you say, not so much the joke, is the way. If I talk about weather, everyone laughs. But if I tell that that joke a Somali audience, they said, "What are you talking about? The weather is good every day." And mm. or if I talk about um, even some, you know, um, about Somali humour, it's it's not the same as Australian humour, where Australian humour is different. Somali is that. It's a beautiful day. You don't mention that. You still survived. You're alive. You're happy. What are you talking about? You had a good day. So does that make sense? So if I tell this audience a joke that Somali jokes, they won't laugh. They just stare at me thinking, is his English okay? You know? <laughs> but, uh, but if I tell an Australian joke, then they laugh. So uh, yeah, there is. But I couldn't be wrong. I mean, you put me on the spot. Or that's my excuse. But I think that, yeah, there, there is. As a public speaker, if I speak to young people and I don't mention things in Australia, they won't get it. Belanga? Um, I'm just, I just want to go back to your question. Um, was your question, is there an, an, an African-Australian story? Is that what, what you is asked? Is there such a thing? And, and what does it um, look like? Yeah. Um, I think it comes from one's journey, one's experience. You know, um, you you are influenced by your, you know, by your background uh, uh, to, a, to a large extent. Uh, me, having come to Australia as, a, as an adult, grown up, my stories will be, uh, will be guided by my African experience, by my African background. And then the other, the other part that I can't avoid, which Abdi you know, mentioned, which is that uh, there will be some said the story is tragedy, you know, in it. But I, uh, I like to turn that tragedy into humor. Uh, uh, by, by saying humor, I'm, I'm talking about people laughing at me, you know, uh, in my, tra you know, in my tra tragic experience, hopefully learning from, uh, uh, fr from my story. But that's Australian actually making make yourself like that is actually Australian humor. Yeah, I guess yeah, so. Not I different guess that's to American. Where, you know, yeah. I want to get. I want to come. I want. I want to make sure that the audience can. I don't want to stand there, and talk about. I suffered. <laughs> oh, people, kids don't want to hear that. The audience doesn't want to hear that. So I gotta try and color it, you know, uh, in a different way. And yet, the you know the people whose experience uh, you came here as a child and. Uh, I don't know how, <clears throat> how old you were when you came to Australia earlier. Maybe you were born here. 
Yeah. So your experience, one, I don't know how much you'll be guided by Africa as well, but it, it'll, be, it'll be slightly different because of how old one was and how, how much you were exposed to Africa at home as well. And like I could close my eyes and listen to Alia. She sounds like an Aussie, you know, uh, to me. Like if you had my children speaking, they, they're Aussies, you know, and yet when I speak, no, I've got an accent <laughs> because I don't speak Australian. <laughs> Alia? <sighs> <laughs> I think for there to be, um, hey, this is me and my personal opinion right now. Um, for there to be African-Australian writing, I think that we need to define what what an Australian identity is and then let's define what an African identity is and let's bring it together and then define what both of those two marriages, what that marriage looks like. Um, when, I'm in, when I'm in Australia, I'm African. When I'm in Africa, I'm Australian. <laughs> so I don't know what it looks like to be both of those things at the same time, mm. um, even though I sound Australian. <laughs> um, so I would like to hope that there is such a thing and there possibly it's something that, um, you know, amazing children's books like the ones that, that you've written are possibly a stepping stone in that direction. But I think that there are bigger questions here about identity and defining that um, within a con contemporary context that I think that we haven't even begun to unpack here within the Australian context. Um, so before we can think about Australian uh, African writing, I think that there are some identity questions that you know mm. need yeah. to be answered. But you, couldn't one argue that even um, amongst that struggle of identity, that perhaps that's when narratives are even more important, so people can have that visibility that you talked about? Definitely, there's not a question about that. I think that in those spaces. Um, you find yourself much more... Why I love writing is because that's where I find myself. In, in, in writings like, I'm gonna say Americana because it's top of mind right now, and, you know, that's where I find myself. But in terms of trying to connect that to an identity that exists in a tangible, real way, I find that a little bit possibly difficult to do and a little bit problematic because you're faced with these very real questions on a daily basis. You know, where are you from? Uh, St. Albans, you know? Um, you go back to Africa, oh, it's great that you're visiting, when are you going home, you know? So there's an in-between space that possibly is, you know, where art fits in um, and where you find yourself in. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's an, an easy answer. It's very early stage. For that question, um, uh, African, I think the, the, the one thing I should say, I don't want to be negative, but African people have more negative than positive. So you're dealing with, uh, when you're writing a story, you have to be really, really clever about what you're doing, what's around you. Because people have never met, Af like I go to Beechworth and country Aubrey Wodonga, and I ask young people, have you ever met African person before? And they will say, no, I haven't. Oh, so you mean people have negative perceptions about Africans? In general, yeah. more so yeah. than other cultures. Yeah. Even the name African, I find very it's disturbing because I am African, but I want to be Somali. And I'm not, I'm not this, I really love you too, but, you know, <laughs> the point is I do. But then you don't want to be that extreme person, you know. But when do the world stop saying African? Like when? So it's very difficult to explain our children. What do we do? You know, we're all different. I mean, my son, when we got to the shops, he was the Indian person. Are they from Somalia? No, they are not. <laughs> Why is he saying that? I mean, they're Indian and we're from Somalia. So that, that dark skin color. So I find a very disturbing African person. I mean, I'm, if I meet a European person, I'll say, are you Swedish because you look pink? No, I don't. But, you know, I, I actually say that, you know, like I say, are you Swedish? I actually respect them. I said, are you from Sweden? And, and they say, no, I'm from Denmark. Sorry, being racist. But th the thing is, so when, when are we going to stop that? You know, when, when, when do we become just a South African and from Somalia? You know, I think that, that's the, I, I honestly mean the best way. 
And yeah, this is when that stops, then we can think about, as you said, identity. Then we can talk about what's your heritage and things like that. Mm. All right. Does anyone have any questions? I think maybe I started something. <laughs> well, so I, I really enjoyed this discussion. One of the things I'm interested in, and I'm South African, um, and obviously grew up in South Africa, it's interesting for me what the set works in schools are. And that's where I'm leading to when I ask this question. Um, how, have, I mean, how many copies of your book, for example, do you sell into Africa? And preempting the sort of answer to that, what are the challenges in selling your book in a place like, you know, in, in Africa versus in, in Australia? And I guess perhaps your book is ostensibly written for an Australian audience, and, or it may just be written for people to read. And I'm interested because, and I'm interested particularly in how you've been received in Australia relative to how you were received in either Somalia or Eritrea or South Africa? Good question. Um, well, I'll answer that one first. My book uh, uh, didn't sell as many copies in South Africa, mainly was because it wasn't promoted. It sold a lot more copies in England, you know, but uh, also I wasn't there to promote the book. You know, so it's interesting that uh, that's the case. And a few, even a few more copies in, um, um, in America as well. Um, I, I mean, I guess, you know, I would have to be in South Africa and uh, uh, promote the book. Um, uh, South Africans seem to, um, uh, like now, like it's, it seems to be like a, a growing thing. I don't know if you've, if you've noticed that. Picture books you know, seem to be coming from all directions. You even go to game parks, you know, like uh, uh, you, you go to game parks where they're selling trinkets and all that. And there's um, shelves and shelves of um, uh, uh, picture books. You know, uh, and I always come come back to Australia armed, you know, with a, uh, a lot of books. And it's easy for me to bring those because uh, if I bought a skin of an Impala, you know, the customs won't let me in, you know, with it. <laughs> but they'll let me into the country with the books, so that's fine. Yeah. Do you want to go for next? No, you can. Yeah. Um, the, the, if I remember, the question is that, yes, it's a good point. What I do is I don't manipulate people, but what I try to do is uh, in Australia, it's a written book, it's about refugees, about resilient adversity, uh, it's about whatever in Australia. And you can sell it to Australian audience because even the school curriculum, you can say you can learn disaster, what happened to Addi, is alive today, um, things like that. And uh, but that's great. But in, in Somali, when I work to Somali people, I'll say, you know what? This, they said, oh, I can't believe you wrote a book. What they're concentrating is they're so proud that I wrote a book. And I'll say, you know, you should read my book because you should. Uh, because I wrote. There's no... So it perceived... Because they don't want to know anything refugee. A lot of Somali people don't want to be labelled as refugee, like everyone else. They come to Australia. They've been here a long time, like yourself. You know, you don't want to be labelled. I'm sure you struggle with sometimes when people call you things that you are not, but you look like. Um, so Somali people don't like the idea of a disaster. and You know, these things happen and we move on where I come as a storyteller. So Somali people, they buy it because they support me maybe, but uh, for the Australian audience, maybe they learn about refugee and some Australian friends that support me, but it's a totally different, they perceived it differently. But Abdi, as you say as well, I guess it's useful to make you know, Australians feel you know, feel guilty about that you're a refugee, buy my book, you know, like a, <laughs> I was a refugee. So if it, if it no, works. I think it's a good story and I'm a really talented man. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, did you want to add something? No, I think that's covered it. Okay. Um, any other questions? Oh, I, you've kind of picked up on it a little bit, but is there such a thing as African? You go first. That was this one. Do you mean as um, an identity or as in writing? Just African. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think um, where I will differ with, uh, with Abdi, I will say I feel very strongly, you know, uh, as an African. But I do stress to people that Africa is not uniform. You know, there's many countries in Africa. There's many languages in Africa that are spoken by different people. And within Africa, there's many, many uh, uh, kinds of... Um, uh, different kinds of food, you know. I I encourage people to, you know, like within within Melbourne, uh, you can you can find Soma Somalian food, you can find uh, South African food, 
you know, of course, there's no South African restaurant. Uh, you can find um, uh, Eritrean as well as uh, Ethiopian food, you know, if you go to you know, certain places. But I still feel uh, very strongly about that African, you know, identity. Not that I walk around, you know, holding a placard saying I'm African, you know, <laughs> but I feel very strongly about that. Can I just touch on that? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm real. I'm, I'm here. I'm a person. It's part of the identity, I suppose. It depends on your question, again, about what you mean in terms of is African real? Is, do you mean in terms of identity? Do you mean in, in terms of a historical, social, political context? I guess the definition is how you answer, how you would answer that question. In some ways, I think it's easy to say there's an Australian identity because we're just the one landmass with states and territories in it, but because Africa, though I do know there's a lot of differences between Queensland, Tasmania, Western Australia, all of those things, but are you Eritrean African or, or just African? How much does your own nationality come into it? I could break it down by tribe. Yes. <laughs> It's, it, it, we all have pr plural identities, mm. right? So in terms of trying to um, distill that and bring it down to this uh, very um, succinct package of, of what a person is, I think it's, it, it can be very difficult. And I think it would be the same of anybody, regardless which continent that they, they come from. So I, for me personally, I would say I'm African, I'm Eritrean, I'm also Blen. I, there are so many different languages, all of these different things. So. Yeah, I guess broadening that question um, will problematise the answer. Yeah. Uh, um, um, I mean, Could I'll give you a chance. Um, when I look at South Africa recently, and I think people might have heard, and as a South African in the audience, you'd have heard about the xenophobic uh, attack that was um, metal against other Africans, people from Somalia, people from uh, uh, Zimbabwe, Nigeria. Um, uh, in South Africa right now, there's an emphasis about uh, uh, the fact that we are all Africans. Do not divide people, do not attack people because they come from a, a different part of Africa. The Congolese are Africans. The Zambians are Africans. The, uh, uh, the Somalian people who are in South Africa are Africans. So there's a big emphasis on unifying so, you know, Africans in South Africa as Africans, rather than you know saying this one is not South African enough. This one speaks with a, a strange accent. So there is that emphasis. And for me, I felt really comfortable with that because uh, uh, that whole thing of attacking people from uh, other countries by by other Africans in South Africa was not a right thing. And. I experienced something, I won't mention where the people came from. I was in Footscray. Um, we brought a, a group of South African musicians uh, from the Soweto Gospel Choir, Memeza, and they were performing at the Footscray Community Art Center. I don't know if, you know, if anybody saw them. And uh, I was handing out flyers about, you know, that, uh, about that group, and I remember coming across someone, uh, two different groups of people, uh, who immediately said to me, oh, they're from South Africa. I don't like you South Africans. And these people were, uh, were Africans, you know, living in Footscray. And to, to have that kind of um, uh, bad blood, unnecessary, it's not the right thing. And the fact that in South Africa, the government has decided to emphasize Africanism, I think it's a very positive thing. Mm. i just quickly very say, because yep. this is a little bit different. Uh, in Somalia, I grew up uh, very modern Somali. Like there was I, I, tribal things like it wasn't in the city. People smoked marlabore, if you want to call. People drink tea outside. The mics play soccer. So as African, I see African when African people have a, a musician and dancing. That's how I see Africans. So that's why I don't identify as so much. I am African visibly, and I will tell you, but deep down, as I am actually grew up as a Somali, and then the continent is African. So when I meet you, your brothers and sisters are from Africa, but I don't see it as such an African person, because I didn't grow up like that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see myself. And I think the 
political issues within some of the regions play a factor into how people identify as African, whether it's colonialism, shared histories in that sense, whether it's the formation of the borders in some of the countries, because some of them are quite young in that sense. So I guess perhaps why some people might identify more as African than as others. When I try to feed Eid, I'll say I'm African. Yeah. <laughs> no, All right. Well, we'll have to bring tonight's One conversation to an there, end. We've unfortunately run out of time. Uh, you might have to hang back and talk to, talk to these guys. But um, on behalf of the Wheeler Centre, I'd really like to thank you for coming along to the Africa Talk series. It's been really fantastic having people coming um, to listen to some of these great conversations. If you do want to buy uh, Valanga's book or Abdi's book, um, there's someone from Readings that's selling the books at the back and they'll stick around to sign them. But again, thank you so much for your time and hope you had a great night. Thank you.